Well, hello and welcome to this online gathering of Grace Church Australia. My name is Pastor Wayne. It is great to be with you today as we have our dedicated online gatherings. Now, as a church, as Grace Church, we are meeting Sunday mornings and that's going to be at the Bonnells Bay Youth and Community Centre, 9.30am every Sunday morning. However, if you can't make it, that is okay because we will continue to have a dedicated online service and obviously you're watching so you found where we are. But from 6pm, Monday evenings at gracegathering.online, that is the place that you can gather with us online. And we want to make sure that we stay connected uh, for everybody that is joining us during these online gatherings. But if you can be with us in person on Sunday mornings, of course, we would love for you to be able to do that as well. Now, in terms of our giving, uh, we continue to do that online only. So details on the screen there for you in terms of tithes or uh, your missions offering or any other offering, uh, the, the details on the screen. And thank you so much to everybody who is faithfully sowing into the kingdom of God uh, with your giving. Also wanted to let you know that here in Southern Lake Macquarie, we've got a combined service taking place the 7th of March, 6 p.m. It's at Morissette Baptist Church. It's the first one of the year in support of SRE. We know it's such an important ministry as uh, men and women go into the schools and share the love of Jesus and the good news, the gospel of grace through teaching scripture. And so I uh, encourage you to be there Sunday evening, the 7th of March at Morissette Baptist Church. And you'll hear from the teachers and uh, you'll hear from uh, the organization South Lakes Christian Education Association with regards to what is happening in SRE. Now today, we are going to continue a conversation that I started a couple of weeks back, but my wife Jackie continued last week. And it's all about our vision for 2021, transform our community. So that is coming up. But before we get there, I want us to head into a time of worship. And I really want to, uh, on whatever day you're watching this, if uh, you've had a tough day, I want you to try and set that aside and just come into the presence of God, because I know very much that when you have those encounters with him, whatever weight you are carrying is lifted and there's this sense of freedom and this sense of awe. And I want you to experience that today as we head into this time of worship. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering. Breath of God, fan us into We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh.
God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future.
not just at the beginning And you're not just watching from the end But you're walking with me in the middle You're walking with me in the middle You're the God of the middle You're Jehovah in the middle serve a faithful king. Would you lift up a shout of praise in this room tonight? He's faithful. Come on. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He doesn't change. He's consistent. He doesn't change. He's consistent. I do love that song and how it speaks into the goodness of God and that everything that is taking place is held in his hand. He's holding it all together. I hope it was an encouragement for you today. Well, welcome back or continued welcome to you if uh, you're joining us for this online gathering of Grace Church Australia today. We're going to continue with a series that we've been running over the last couple of weeks, and it very much is about us unpacking the vision that we feel the Lord has given our church in our region for 2021. And we shared last week that that vision is all around transform our community. So in 2020, our vision was simply transform, and we didn't really, I guess, understand the full impact of what that would mean. But uh, the Holy Spirit very clearly said towards the end of last year. I want you to build on that. That was kind of the, the first block or the first brick in what he is um, building through Grace Church in our region. So this year in 2021, it's about transforming our community. And so throughout the year and indeed today, we'll be speaking a lot about what that actually means for us as a church, but also what it means for you as a follower of Jesus, because we all have that role to play. We are all ministers of the gospel. And uh, as I'm going to share with you for today, uh, we're going to see what that actually means. And I guess some of the things that we need to be careful about when it comes to transforming our community and making sure that we uh, have the right posture, that we have set the right foundation for us to play the role that I know that God wants each and every one of his followers to play. Now, to start, I want to just go back over what our vision statement is, because it's so important for us as a church to make sure that we know it. I'd love it if you knew it, and Grace Church is your regular home, if you knew it off by heart. But if not, at least if you knew the heart of what the vision is, because at its core, it is a missional statement. 
we are a missional church. We don't just want to run programs. We don't just want to run events or put on activities if we're not actually bringing the gospel and having conversations about who Jesus is, because events and programs are okay, but if that's all they are, someone comes and essentially consumes something for an hour or two, and then they go away and nothing changes and there's no relationship formed and all those kind of things that the gospel clearly tells us, then all we're doing is just wasting our resources. And we, we want to steward well what we have been given, and we want to make sure that we're doing what we as a church have been called to do. So here's what our vision statement says. Grace Church exists to make Jesus known to the people of Lake Macquarie and beyond, to develop them as his disciples and to grow them to Christ-like maturity in a fun, contemporary and relatable way. And that at its core is who we are and why we exist. We exist to make Jesus known. We are missional in all that we do. It's not about us looking inwards. It's about us as a church being outwardly focused and knowing that there are individuals, there are families, there are communities in our region that don't know Jesus, that haven't heard the true gospel, that don't know about his passionate love for them. And we want to make sure that as a church that we are equipping people but we are equipping them to send them out to further the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's why you'll see in that vision statement very much it says Grace Church exists to make Jesus known. That is why we are here as a church and that is what drives all of the decisions that we make. That's all of the reasons for the things that we do in obedience to what God is saying, of course, but they all work towards the outworking and the fulfilling of that vision statement. So today I want to continue a conversation I started a couple of weeks back with regards to a passage from Deuteronomy 15. Now, verses 1 through to 11 is what we're looking at. A couple of weeks back, we looked at verses 1 through to 6, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I would encourage you to uh, just go and have a listen to the message from February 7. Uh, you will find it here at gracegathering.online. Um, but in terms of context, I do want to read those verses, but our focus today will be verses 7 through to 11, and what I believe God wants to say to us with regards to our place and our purpose in what he is doing in the region where we are based as a church. So if you've got your Bibles, love for you. I'm reading from the modern English version today. Uh, your version might be a little bit different. So because of that, you will see uh, the passage on the screen for you as well. In verse 1, Deuteronomy 15, here's what we read. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a relinquishing of debts. This is the manner of the relinquishing. Every creditor that has loaned anything to his neighbor shall relinquish it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's relinquishment. You may collect it from a foreigner, but that which your brother has that is yours, your hand shall release. However, there will be no poor among you. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess. If only you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God by carefully observing all these commandments which I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you and you will lend to many nations but you shall not borrow. You will reign over many nations but they will not reign over you. Now, this is where we stopped last time, and I really went through and I unpacked a fair bit of what was there. But what I want to do today is continue from verse 7, and we're going to have a look at what it is that God is saying to us. But here's the thing. As we read this passage, it talks about giving to the poor. And I don't want us to read this with eyes where we're thinking just about a financial giving or a financial blessing, because we know in scripture, it talks about the poor in spirit. And I want us to read from that context that those that are poor, they may be earthly, in earthly terms, they may be rich, but we are talking about those that are spiritually poor, those whose eternal destiny is not 
locked away because they're not walking with Jesus. They don't have that assurity of salvation that if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, that you have, that I have. And so I want us to look with those eyes if we can. So picking up Deuteronomy 15 from verse 7, this is our focus for today. If there be among you a poor man, one of your brothers within any of your gates in your land, which the Lord your God has given you, you must not harden your heart or shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and must surely lend him what is sufficient for his need in that which he lacks. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin in you. You must surely give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because in this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all that you put your hand to do. For the poor will never cease from being in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and needy in your land. Now, again, what I want to do is just really focus on some parts of this passage. I know that we don't have time today to do a really deep dive into it and to break it all apart. And so the context that I am reading this particular passage and sharing with you today is all around that vision of transform our community. And so those are the eyes that we are reading this passage of scripture with. And when you do that, you will see that there are two main things that it focuses on. One is the heart and one are our hands. And my beautiful wife, Jackie, shared greatly last week on a lot of this. So I'm just going to build upon what she spoke about when it comes to that. And the first thing I want to focus on is the heart, because it makes it very clear in this passage from Deuteronomy 15, the condition of our heart is so very, very important. And we know from other parts of scripture how important our heart is to God. He's not necessarily focused or concerned primarily with what we can do or, you know, what gifts we have or anything like that. It always starts with the condition of our heart. When our heart's in the right place, then we know that we can be used by God for his plans and his purposes. So if we go to verse seven, we'll see very much that there is a red flag. There's a bit of a warning, something for us to be mindful of when it comes to those that are poor in our community. Now, remember I said that you could look at this and think financially poor, and that's definitely one aspect, but we are looking at it uh, for those that are spiritually poor. Our vision, our mission as a church is to make Jesus known. So people that don't know Jesus personally as Lord and Savior, that don't have that relationship with him, those are the poor that we are speaking about in this verse. So in verse seven, here's what we read. It says, you must not harden your heart. You must not harden your heart. And that very much, I think, is God saying to us, hey, just be careful. Don't become desensitized to the plight of those that are lost, to the plight of those that are poor. Don't become indifferent to their suffering. Make sure that we maintain a soft heart because sometimes when you're walking with God and life can be not necessarily comfortable because we go through our own trials and challenges and a lot of people at church doing that at the moment, but we have an assurance of knowing that God is with us, knowing that he takes care of us and knowing where our eternal destination is. As our time on this earth finishes, our assurance is that we go to heaven and we party with Jesus. But there are a lot of people in our world, in our communities, that don't have that assurance. And sometimes when you've been in church for a long time and you've been a Christian for a long time, you can not necessarily forget that, but you can become desensitized to it and even to an extent minimize the place where other people find themselves. And I think that's why this part of verse seven is such a great reminder for us 
to make sure that we don't harden our hearts. Now, we don't never deliberately do that. I don't think that there is a follower of Jesus that says, all right, I'm just going to harden my heart right now and uh, it is what it is. So I just don't care about this person or that person. I don't care what's going on. My heart's just hard, so be it. It doesn't happen like that. But what happens is across time as we journey through this earth, as we go through our own stuff individually and as families and even as churches, we can become desensitized. We can want to stay in a safe place, a place that's comfortable, a place that is known. And when we do that, we stop being the church that we are called to be. And so here in verse seven, I think it's a great reminder for us just to be very, very careful when it comes to that. And I know for me, it's something I've got to continually check. I've got to continually say to myself, is my heart being hardened towards this person or that person? No greater example for me than my wife and I lived in Sri Lanka as missionaries for a, a number of years. And what actually happened was we would constantly um, be confronted with beggars on the street because they see a white person, they think you're a tourist who has a lot of money. And so everybody comes up to you and says, Mr. Mr. I want some money. I want some money. And over time, that can wear you down. Emotionally, it can wear you down. Physically, it can wear you down. Spiritually, it can wear you down. And you can get to the point where you are so desensitized to the plight of these people for who a dollar would make such a big difference that you can walk past and almost like, you know, when the Good Samaritan was on the side of the road and so many people just walked past him and ignored him and the plight. And I want to make sure that we're not like that. I want to make sure that we're like uh, the Good Samaritan who crossed the road to check on this man and then uh, got him into some accommodation and, and paid his bill and all those kind of things. And so for us, when we lived in Sri Lanka as missionaries, we had to come up with some strategies to make sure that we had a softness in our heart, to make sure that our heart was beating in unison with the Father's heart. Because I know that when our Father in heaven sees these people that are in need on the side of the road, you know, in rags and just begging so they can have something to eat and they may not have eaten for days, I know that his heart is filled with compassion for them. And I want to make sure that my heart and your heart and our heart collectively as a church continues to beat in unison with the Father's heart. And I think that's why uh, there's such a, an important reminder here in verse 7 to make sure that we're very, very careful that our hearts don't get hardened. As I said, it's not a deliberate act. It's one of those things that can slowly, just slowly drift in and our heart can get a little bit hard and a little bit hard and a little bit hard. And before you know it, uh, we, we are ignorant or desensitized to the plight of uh, other people who are poor, either financially or in spirit or in some other way. And the importance of that is reinforced in verse 10, because again, we're essentially told the same thing. It says, your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. And that's because our tendency, our human tendency, is when we give, is not that we don't give uh, unwillingly, because we, as you know, followers of Jesus, uh, we have learnt to give willingly, but sometimes there is this kind of almost grieving, you know, when we have to give. And I don't experience it too much, many, very much anymore. But I've been on this lifelong journey since I became a follower of Jesus, this lifelong journey of generosity, because I grew up in a household where there was this poverty spirit and I've had to break free of that. And for the most part, I'm okay. But there's still time, just not very often, every now and again, where I'll give something where rather than just giving, I'm giving, but I'm counting the cost and I'm a little grieved when I'm giving. Now, that's pretty open and it's, you know, not something that I dwell upon, but I'm mindful that it's there. And so I've got to make sure that if I'm giving, and whether that's financial giving, whether it's giving of time, whether it's giving of prayers, uh, or whether it's giving uh, in terms of helping somebody, whatever it might be, we have to make sure that that isn't a, it becomes a grievance for you and for me. Because when I look at God, 
I see somebody who gives generously again and again and again. It's unconditional, it's filled with love, but there's no grievance there. It's not like our Heavenly Father is just sitting on the throne thinking, oh no, I've got to give to Wayne again. How am I going to cope with that? I really don't want to do it. All that kind of thing. Now, obviously, I'm going over the top when it comes to you know, explaining that. But it's so very important for us to know that as we transform our community by giving, we need to make sure that it isn't done with a sense of grieving. And so that's why verse 10 very much speaks to that. Now, there's a great quote from the author Joyce Rupp. Here's what she says. A generous heart freely gives and can live without some of the material things we think are so desperately needed. A generous heart is also one that can give freely of the greater non-material gifts such as compassion, understanding, patience and forgiveness. And I think we could probably agree things like patience and compassion and forgiveness are so needed in our world today because sadly these are things that are on the decline. Uh, you know, com for example, compassion is being uh, replaced with a selfishness. Forgiveness is being replaced with retaliation. That kind of thing is taking place in our world. And we as the church have a chance to turn that around. We have a chance as a church to change the course of what is happening in our communities because we want to reflect the heart of the Father. And I know that his heart is all about showing compassion. It's all about forgiveness. It's all about love. It's all about the things that are disappearing in our world. And nowhere is that probably seen better than is in uh, Psalm 145. I think it's verse nine. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. The Lord is good to everyone. He blesses everyone. Doesn't matter. He provides for everyone. Doesn't matter the, where they're at, the condition of their heart. He is not discriminating against uh, those that he is compassionate towards. That's the Father's heart. And I want that to be your heart. I want that to be my heart. I want that to be the heart of Grace Church. Because the reality is our communities and people in our communities aren't really interested in just hearing us speak. They have heard across the years so many Christians talking about who God is and, and about how he loves them, etc., etc. But there's this disconnect between what the church has been saying and what the church has been doing. And I firmly believe that when our communities see the heart of God through us, then it gives us an opportunity to have some conversations about who he is and about why it is that they need Jesus in their life. But it starts with the heart. And that's the first part of Deuteronomy 15 today that I want us to grab hold of. Because the truth is, if our heart isn't in the right place, then nothing else is going to happen. God can't use us if we don't have the right heart condition. It's a bit like, you know, when you sow seed, for example, in your garden. If your garden doesn't have the right soil, nothing's going to grow. But when the soil is there, then you start to get those green shoots and things start to pop up. Same kind of thing here in terms of what God is speaking to us about today from Deuteronomy 15. We need to make sure that our heart isn't hardened. Our heart is in unison with the Father's heart, that we are beating together in time with his heart. When we do that, then we start to see the importance of our hands. So let's go back to verse 7 because I want to see the last part of that. And then we'll have a look at verse 8. But we were instructed or warned earlier not to harden our heart. But here's what verse 7 also says. You must not harden your heart or shut your hand. And then in verse 8, we actually see the posture that we should take towards our community. But you shall open your hand wide. And last week, Jackie really shared a great message on the two hands. And one, the left hand representing the presence of God. 
Uh, the other hand, the right hand, representing the mercy of God or his compassion. And the important thing when it comes to the hands is that they have to work together. We can't have one without the other. And I love the message translation, Matthew 9, verse 13. God says to us, I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not to coddle insiders. And for us as a church, we say that we are here to go beyond the walls. We're not here for us, although that is important, our fellowships and our connection and iron up, sharpening iron and equipping each other. But we are here for outsiders, those that don't yet know Jesus. But I love that God says, I'm after mercy, not religion. Because religion, the, the world now communities, they don't want that. It's a, from their perspective, a set of rules that they have to follow. And so they're not interested in that. But when we show them the heart of God, they understand who he is, his compassion for them, and the passionate love that he has for them. So I just really love the fact that this passage talks about those hands that are open. And as I touched on just a moment ago, the hands have to be open together. It's not enough if people come into the presence of God, but nothing changes. If they, because I have heard stories and you probably have as well, people that have come to church that they felt the presence of God. They leave that church gathering and they just go back to their normal life. Nothing has changed. It's only been one open hand. Or what about many great charities and organizations that are showing mercy, that are showing compassion, that are meeting physical needs, but they're not addressing the spiritual component, which is so very important. We want to make sure that when we are transforming our community, that it's not a temporal transformation, but it's an eternal transformation, that we're not just addressing a need here and now, but we're addressing a lifelong need, an eternal life need in terms of Jesus as Lord and Savior. So the two, hand, the two hands go together. And if you've ever tried to move something with one hand or open a jar with one hand or do something with one hand, you would know how difficult it can be. Now, you might be able to get something done, but it's never done as efficiently or as easily as when you are using two hands. And so the truth is the same for you and for me when it comes to representing Jesus in our communities. Let's be there with our left hand and bring people into the presence of God. Let's be there with our right hand, showing his mercy and compassion as we do that. And together with those hands united, we know that we are gonna impact our communities. We know that lives are going to be changed. We know that chains are going to be broken, that people will be set free and our communities will be transformed because there's an encounter with God. And I shared about that a little while back about Saul and his encounter with God and how that turned his life around. But there's also the mercy and the compassion of God. And I kind of want you to think about it like this. If I'm dangling off the edge of a cliff, or maybe you're dangling off the edge of a cliff, I'm not going to ask somebody, hey, put your fist out so I can grab hold of it. Because I don't want a hand that is closed. I want a hand that is open. I'm gonna ask for somebody's hand so that I can grab hold of that hand. And that's what our community is looking for. They may not know it, but they're looking for a hand to grab hold of. And that's our role, you and I, as the church. And I love in Psalm 145, verse 16, what it says when our hands are open. When you open your generous hand, it's full of blessings, satisfying the longings of every living thing. When you open your hands, and I want to make sure that we are as a, a church that operates with open hands. Because when your hand is closed, when you've created a fist, you can't hold on to anything. You can't give anything. You can't receive anything. It's only when your hand is open can you hold on to that which you, God has given you. It's only when your hands are open can you freely give to those that are in need. But it's also only when your hands are open that you can receive from others and from God. 
Open hands are so very, very important when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to our role as Grace Church in transforming our community. And when I think about Jesus, I think about a man whose hands were always open. They were open to heal people. They were open to bless people. They were open to comfort people. His ministry really was a ministry of open hands. And I think like in all things, that should be our reference point. That should be who we are modeling our personal lives, but also our collective corporate lives as a church in terms of who Jesus was and how he went about ministry. And this is reinforced in Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Church, that's the posture. That's how I want us as a church to be. Because the truth is, your neighbor needs you. Your family needs you. Your community needs you. And the kingdom of God needs you to represent Jesus in all that we are doing and the role that we are playing in transforming our community. Whether that's in Southern Lake Macquarie, whether that's in the northern parts of the Central Coast, if you're watching us today from another part of the uh, Australia, another part of the world, it doesn't matter when your heart is in the right place and when your hands are opened, God can use you to achieve his plans and his purposes. And I just want to make sure that we are ready, that we are open and available for what God wants to do in and through us. So we're gonna to finish today with a song. It's a song called Fresh Fire. And I just really wanna speak a new anointing over you today. I want to speak a freshness of that Holy Spirit fire in you. I want to wake up and aliven and bring back to life anything maybe which has just died down. You know, the embers might be there, but there's no flames. You're not roaring with passion for what God wants to do. So just sit in his presence. I want you to open your spirit to what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you through this song, in this moment of time. And I speak a fresh anointing. I speak the fire of God to rise up inside you. And collectively, you and me and the church, we can see our communities transformed in the mighty name of Jesus.
Light a match and let it go Set ablaze, uncontrolled I want that fire I want that fire So light a match Come on. and let it go Set ablaze, uncontrolled I really hope that the Holy Spirit was just speaking to you and stirring something in the depths of your spirit. Thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to, as we close, I just want us to agree on a couple of things if we can. Can we agree to be the church that sets aside our own needs so that we can reach those that are poor in our community? Can we agree to be the church that takes the extra step and goes the extra mile when God asks us to do that? Can we agree to be the church 
that willingly makes Jesus known at every situation and every opportunity that we have. I pray a blessing over you today. I thank you so much for joining us online for Grace Church Australia. Just a reminder, we gather in person 9.30 Sunday mornings at the Bonnells Bay Youth and Community Centre. We would love to see you there. And if you can't make it to those in-person gatherings for whatever reason, we look forward to seeing you from 6 p.m. next Monday, each Monday evening, 6 p.m. right here at gracegathering.online. <laughs>